Good morning, everybody. Um, Carrie sent me a message yesterday with a picture outside of our church that says services are canceled. Um, I have never met a minister who's ever had to do something like this. I asked some of our members if we've ever had to cancel church, and I haven't heard a single story. Um, so we are in difficult and unique circumstances. Um, on the one hand, those circumstances are scary. Uh, things feel uncertain because of the coronavirus, and in many ways this is revealing to us just how out of control our world uh, and the world really is. Uh, we don't have the final say on how things go, and the only one who is sovereign and rules over all things is God. Um, on the other hand, though, we found out very quickly that there were confirmed cases of the virus at UT, uh, which is right at our doorstep, and we have technological opportunities uh, to do something like this, uh, to film this service and to be able to stream it into your homes. Um, it's not the same as meeting together. I would much rather be together this morning. Um, it was really tough as leaders to cancel our worship service today, but we can use this opportunity uh, to fulfill our mission, to love God and to love others. Um, I was able to spend time yesterday just making phone calls to uh, people in our church, and we kind of sent out a lot of different messages, emails, uh, texts, and phone calls. And it was a huge blessing to have those conversations. You know, I wondered to myself, why haven't I done this more often? Why haven't I reached out? Um, I know that in this time uh, of staying home that it can feel very isolating um, to be stuck where we are, um, but maybe our phones can actually be good, uh, put to a good use for once. Uh, we could call each other, uh, check in on each other this week and make sure everyone we know and love is doing okay. So if you're struggling especially, we'd ask you to reach out to us. We want to uh, come to you. We don't think that gathering together is safe right now, uh, but we do want to uh, fulfill our calling to be your ministers, to care for you, and so we want to come to you if we're able. So reach out to us um, if you are struggling in this time of social distancing. Um, you may be tuning in by yourself uh, with a few others from church or maybe just your family. So I'd encourage you to have a few things ready uh, for this service. First of all, uh, if you're not using your phone to watch this video, I'd really encourage you to silence your cell phone or turn it off completely uh, just for the duration of this video so that you can be um, present and watching uh, this video without distraction. Uh, second of all, if you have a physical Bible with you, uh, that would be really helpful. We're going to be reading uh, from Scripture today, uh, and so I don't want you to have to kind of toggle back between one app on your phone and the Bible app on your phone. So grab a physical Bible, uh, have that open to Exodus 14. That's where we'll be uh, throughout this service. Uh, but third, I just ask you to take a second to prepare yourself uh, to be silent for a few moments, and I'm going to do that, uh, but I ask you or your family just to be silent as we prepare to worship today. One of the songs that Ben planned for us to sing is called, Lord, Make Us Instruments of Your Peace. And it contains these lyrics, and I just want to want us to reflect on them. Where there is hatred, we will sow his love. Where there is injury, we will never judge. Where there is striving, we will speak his peace. Where there is blindness, we will pray for sight. Where there is darkness, we will shine his light. Where there is sadness, we will bear their grief. I think those lyrics are perfectly fitting for the situation in which we find ourselves. Many of us feel like our world is chaotic and the circumstances that make our lives feel stable are changing rapidly because of the coronavirus. Um, and so I think in the midst of uh, chaos, unpredictability, uh, and so much suffering of people who are faced with this illness, what if we were instruments of God's peace in this time? 
I think this song teaches us two things. First of all, we need God's peace, not our own self-created peace. We can't just force the world to be peaceful in the way we want it to be. But second of all, uh, we don't want to have God's peace just to hoard it to ourselves. We don't want to be selfish with God's peace. We want to be instruments of God's peace. In the midst of uh, difficult times, Christians have often uh, run towards the problem, not away from it. So what if we were so proactive as neighbors, as uh, people in the Austin community, and we were instruments of God's peace? I think this song is really important for all of us, especially today. Uh, we usually, during our services, enter a time of intercessory prayer. This is where we pray on behalf of others. So I'd like you to pray with me now and bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we pray today for our world, our city, and our church. First of all, we pray for the world, which is reeling with fear about this pandemic. We ask you to help us as Christians throughout the world to have both courage and joy in the midst of fear and despair. Second, we pray for our city. We've come to realize that we are not exempt from this virus either, and we should always recognize that death is our enemy, and we ask you to teach us to number our days, to realize we don't have control over our lives, we're not exempt, from death or suffering, and so as this city faces a very real threat, uh, we pray for all of us Christians to be the ones who recognize that this is, this is part of life. This is part of what we face each and every day. We are not in control of our lives. And I pray for this city uh, to take all the proper measures in reacting uh, to this virus. We pray that um, in the midst of all this chaos, uh, that we uh, would respond without panic um, and without uh, despair. Third, we pray for our church, University Avenue Church of Christ. We pray for everyone uh, who is just nervous and anxious about what's going on. Uh, we ask you to help us in this time when we're separated from each other. And we pray that when we reconvene, that you make us even closer than we were before. We now know what it's like to go without church when we want to be together. And we're chastened by the fact that something came between brothers and sisters in Christ. So help us to cherish each other all the more. We continue to pray for the names that we pray for every week. We pray for Dia Moore's family. A.C. Hollifield sister, Sarah and Ward Widener, Maisie Hamrick, Beverly Getty, Ron Boyd, and Francis Izell. We pray for our missionaries, the Escamillas, the Petties, the Napiers, and Jane Gillespie. And we also pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our passage uh, today is from Exodus chapter 14. Uh, so if you have that physical Bible out, I'd love for you to turn there. Exodus is the second book of the Bible, and so we'll be near the beginning of the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 14. Um, I'd like to spend time just reading this whole passage. It's a passage that is very famous uh, to Christians and Jews alike. We celebrate the Exodus, um, but it's good to hear it all in one sitting. Um, these texts were meant to be heard aloud, so I'd like you to listen uh, to this whole chapter and maybe follow along in your physical Bible. This is Exodus chapter 14, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp in front of Pi Hahiroth between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall camp opposite by the sea. Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, They are wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness has closed in on them. 
I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, so that I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. So in verse 5, when the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the minds of Pharaoh and his officials were changed toward the people, and they said, What have we done, letting Israel leave our service? So he had his chariot made ready. He took his army with him. He took 600 selected chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the Israelites who were going out boldly. The Egyptians pursued them, all of Pharaoh's horses and all of his chariots, his chariot drivers and his army. They overtook them camped by the sea. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die out in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. And you only have to learn to keep still. But then the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. Lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. And then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh and his chariots and his chariot drivers. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went beyond them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind the Israelites. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. So the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. The waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw them into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Last week we talked about the plagues of Egypt. We covered all ten of them, and we learned that they aren't just about God showing his power uh, over the world. They're also about God defeating the so-called gods of Egypt. Each plague uh, was God defeating an Egyptian god, which was powerless by comparison. Now, after those plagues, Pharaoh gives Israel up to God. After his son dies in the tenth and final plague, he tells Moses and Aaron, Look, get out of Egypt. I never want to see you again. Leave and take every single Israelite with you. And on the way out, the Egyptians felt the exact same way. They actually give the Israelites their gold just to convince them to get out of the country. Basically, what they thought was, we don't want the Israelites here. 
As long as their God wants them, he's going to plague us until we let them go. So Israel leaves, but instantly Pharaoh regrets it. He thinks to himself, what am I doing? I have all of this free labor, which is walking away, and he's totally forgotten the ten plagues that have just happened. He just wants his free labor. So he chases after them. He meets them at the Red Sea, and it looks like he's cornered them. There's the Egyptian army on one side, the Red Sea on the other. There's nowhere for the Israelites to go. But God parts the Red Sea so Israel can walk through on dry ground. Pharaoh himself chases after them as they cross through the sea. But as soon as Israel is on the other side, God brings the waters back together and destroys Israel's enemy. Now, here's the thing, here's the way that this applies to us. Because the exodus happened, we learn something about true freedom. And this is what this whole series has been about. We've been in the book of Exodus to talk about what is the nature of true freedom. Now, we talked about false ideas of freedom, but what we want is not any of those. We want true freedom from God. And if God really delivered Israel this way, we learn that true freedom is a gift. The story of the Israelites' freedom is not a story of self-liberation. They are not a self-made nation. They don't tell their story as a kind of casual migration, exploring new lands as pilgrims. It's not a story of civil war and overcoming the might of Pharaoh. They weren't reformers trying to create a new Egypt in which they could thrive. It's not a story of their cunning and leaving in the middle of the night and escaping the clutches of Pharaoh by their own intelligence. This is all about God freeing the Israelites. There is one being who set the Jews free from slavery, and it's God. Their story is one in which they do not free themselves. Now, in the New Testament, our spiritual freedom is often compared to the freedom that the Israelites received from God in the book of Exodus, which means that if their freedom is a gift, then our freedom is a gift. Our spiritual freedom from sin and death and Satan cannot be achieved and it cannot be earned any more than Israel earned the parting of the Red Sea. You cannot achieve a gift. All you can do is receive it. But if freedom is a gift that can be received, then it can also be rejected. And I think we see this in the, the tragic series of events in Pharaoh's life. Because we're told throughout the book of Exodus that the Pharaoh hardened his heart. And God hardened his heart. But God gives ten opportunities for Pharaoh to change. Ten chances to repent. And after each plague, Pharaoh could have said, look, I am not God. Only Yahweh is God. None of the Egyptian gods are God. Clearly, Yahweh alone is God. And I am, I'm going to do whatever he says, and he's told me to let the Israelites go, so I'm going to send them away. But he can't. He's so unbending. He's so unrepentant. He rejects true freedom. Pharaoh is more of a slave than the Israelites. He cannot change his heart. It is hard and calloused and stubborn. So God says, look, if you don't want to change, if you don't want to repent, you can have it your way. And God hardens his heart. Now, if you receive the gift of freedom that God wants to give all of us, then you can typically go one of two ways with God's gifts. You can either misuse them or you can give them back to God. And I think a kind of perfect demonstration of what we do with God's gifts is seen in the gold that's given to the Israelites. So in the beginning of the book of Exodus, the Israelites have nothing. They have nothing to show for themselves. They are unpaid, forced, coerced slaves. They have nothing. But on the night of the Exodus, the Egyptians just want the Israelites to leave, so they give them gold. And the Israelites then become the richest slaves on earth. But when Israel gets to Mount Sinai, God issues ten commandments. 
One of them is, don't make any image of me. And God specifies, he says, do not make for yourself gods of silver or gods of gold. But what is the very first thing they do with the gold that God has given them? They make a statue of an Egyptian goddess in the shape of a cow. This is the infamous golden calf story in which they take all of the gold they've received from the Egyptians, they melt it down, and they turn it into a calf, which symbolized an Egyptian goddess. And this is perfect to describe our human nature. God is generous to us. He frees us from slavery. He, he gives us abundantly. And then the first thing we do with all of the gifts of God is worship another God. That's called misusing God's gifts. But after the tragedy of the golden cow incident, uh, Moses and the Israelites make something called the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is the sacred tent, which is where God's presence is going to reside as he goes with them to the promised land. Now, in the tabernacle, the Israelites can make sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. God instructs Moses to make portions of the tabernacle out of gold. So what they do is, with all the gold they have left, with all the gold they didn't use on the, the idol, they use for the tabernacle. They use for worship. They give all the gold back to God. This is the 